Ladies and gentlemen, this is DVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and oh, welcome aboard the Eastern Express. Now, in this episode, we're diving into Russia and Ukraine, a war that has not only reshaped the geopolitical landscape of Eastern Europe, but continues to evolve with alarming intensity. Since its invasion in 2022, Russia has been embroiled in a brutal and protracted war against Ukraine. The conflict has caused immense human suffering, with thousands of lives lost and millions displaced. Despite various international sanctions and diplomatic efforts, the situation remains dire and complex as we move through 2024 and look ahead to 2025. Ukraine and Russia are already planning their 2024 winter operations and contemplating their strategies for 2025. The Kremlin is likely to continue its strategy of attrition, with Ukraine set to adapt and seek new methods to counter Russian aggression and ensure that Putin's ambition in Ukraine remain unfulfilled. The past months have been particularly challenging for Ukraine. Last December, Volodymyr Zelensky acknowledged the failure of the 2023 counteroffensive. Since then, Ukraine has faced a shortage of munitions due to delayed debates in U.S. Congress, a significant shortfall in frontline personnel and renewed frequent Russian aerial strikes targeting power generators and combat units. Despite these hardships, the Ukrainian military has only reluctantly ceded ground, managing to redistribute its forces while inflicting heavy casualties on the Russians. Intelligence reports indicate that the past six months experienced the highest daily casualty rates for Russian forces since February 2022, with over 180,000 Russian casualties for a gain of just over 510 square kilometers. Russia's strategy has shifted to smaller, multiple assaults to gradually seize Ukrainian territory. In response, Ukrainian planners are considering future offensive operations to reclaim their territory. Consequently, Europe's strategic awakening after decades of relative tranquility has been notable. European defense budgets are rising, spurred by the realization of the Russian threat and pressure from a looming Trump administration. Investments in defense manufacturing capacity are increasing, potentially allowing Europe to better support Ukraine's military needs from 2025 onwards. This includes military, economic, diplomatic and informational backing and is likely to involve coordination with NATO regarding increased military and financial aid. And now let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. One of the key factors to consider is the strategic objectives of both nations. For Russia, the war is a means to reassert its influence over former Soviet territories and counter what it perceived as NATO's encroachment. Ukraine, on the other hand, is fighting for its sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the right to determine its own political future. As of 2024, the battlefield dynamics have shifted considerably. Ukraine's military, bolstered by Western support and aid, has managed to hold the line against Russian advances. The West's supply of advanced weaponry, intelligence sharing and training has been pivotal in strengthening Ukraine's defense capabilities. However, this support has not come without its own set of challenges and controversies. One major development in the conflict has been the increased use of drones and cyber warfare. These modern tools of war have added a new dimension to the battlefield, making it a conflict fought not just on the ground but in the skies and the cyberspace. Drones have been used extensively for reconnaissance, targeting, and even direct attacks, while cyber operations have targeted critical infrastructure and communication networks. Economically, the war had profound impacts on both countries. Russia, despite its vast resources, has faced significant economic strain due to international sanctions and the cost of prolonged military engagement. Now, these sanctions have targeted key sectors such as energy, finance, and technology, aiming to cripple Russia's war machine. However, Russia has shown resilience by forging closer economic ties with non-Western countries and leveraging its energy exports as a geopolitical tool. Ukraine, meanwhile, has been heavily reliant on international aid to sustain both its economy and military efforts. The country's infrastructure has been devastated, with rebuilding efforts constantly hampered by ongoing conflict. The international community has pledged billions in aid, but the scale of destruction means recovery will be a long process. Looking ahead to 2025, several scenarios could unfold. 
One possibility is a protracted stalemate where neither side gains a decisive advantage, leading to continuous low-intensity conflict. Now, this scenario would likely perpetuate the current humanitarian crisis and Kyiv's economic hardship. Another scenario is a negotiated settlement, though this seems increasingly unlikely given the entrenched positions of both sides. For any meaningful negotiations to take place, significant compromises wouldn't be needed, which neither Russia nor Ukraine appear willing to make at this stage. A more optimistic scenario involves a breakthrough in peace efforts, possibly facilitated by a change in leadership or policy shift in either country. This would require substantial diplomatic efforts and possibly new incentives or pressure from the international community. Regardless of the outcome, the war is undeniably reshaped the strategic calculus of Eastern Europe. NATO has strengthened its presence in the region, and countries like Poland and the Baltic states have ramped up their defenses, wary of potential Russian aggression. The international community's response to this crisis will be crucial in shaping the future. Will we see a renewed commitment to peace and diplomacy, or will the world continue to be drawn into cycles of conflict and retribution? Only time will tell. And now here to shed more light on the issue is Gary Tabash, former Chief of Staff, NATO Military Liaison Mission in Moscow. Hello, sir, and welcome to TVP World. Oh, hello, hello. Very good to be on the TPP World. <laughs> I know it's a busy time. <laughs> All right. So we are looking again, once again, on the well, topic of the Russian-Ukraine war. And a lot of publications have been speculating what's going to happen going forward. Uh, let's just address the elephant uh, in the room first, because after what happens to be an assassination attempt of U.S. President Donald Trump and the discussion of whether or not Trump will be good for NATO, be good for Ukraine, is once again on the top of the discussion. Can you help us uh, break that down a little bit? Sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, if, you see, the thing is, everybody's concentrating uh, what will be when Trump, if Trump uh, becomes a president, what kind of plan he has? But nobody really asking present president what kind of plan he has, what kind of. Uh, it, and everybody's saying if Trump, if Trump, if Trump. But the idea is, you know, Trump is not God, nor Trump in the United States can do whatever he wants to do or create uh, dictatorship. Uh, uh, the the thing is, it also depends on which state our world is going to be at the time if Trump becomes a president of the United States and uh, he's newly uh, uh, selected uh, vice president, uh, Vince, J.D. Vince. So uh, will Ukraine be uh, sign a peace agreement with Russia or ceasefire agreement with Russia or will it continue to fight? Who knows what's going to be in six months? Will China attack Taiwan? So now trying to predict what's going to happen when Trump, if Trump becomes a president, is extremely difficult. And I don't think anybody can give an answer. People can speculate, which I think is, uh, is not right. I think that people uh, can sell you future news, which, of course, that gets lots of views because, you know, you can people can predict future. So a lot of those depends on what kind of situation the world is going to be at that time, uh, what kind of treatment Trump is going to receive from other partners, including NATO partners. Uh, it is very difficult to predict what we can discuss and base uh, an intelligent judgment or intelligent assessment is on what happened in the past. Because if we know what happened in the past, in the past, or contrary to what a lot of people say, uh, uh, Trump strengthened Navy, uh, NATO he, by forcing them to pay everybody to pay their share, not only the United States and Poland and Baltic states, uh, but everybody else from all Europe have to pay their share into NATO, make sure that their, uh, you know, their tanks are rolling, their guns are shooting, the airplanes are flying. Otherwise, you know, if you don't pay the insurance company, it's not going to keep you, you know, keep giving you insurance or continue to be in a golf club if you're not paying your dues. So uh, these things kind of rumors are, uh, and again, while Trump was a president, it's not like 2016 when he was an unknown entity and everybody was saying, oh, he's going to be dictator, he's going to be Hitler, he's going to be this and that. During his reign, there was no wars. A lot of wars were ending. 
Uh, oil prices were low, so our enemies, Russia, Venezuela, and Iran, were uh, you know being on the brink of a bankruptcy. So uh, the the thing is, it pretty much was peaceful in conflict. He didn't put anybody in jail. He didn't sh shut down any kind of channels. He didn't prosecute any reporters that were spreading lies about him. So they, he didn't show any kind of dictatorial uh, uh, threats. And yesterday, the last case against him with the uh, with the classified documents was also dismissed. So all the uh, all the legal problems that he had have been dismissed, have been put out as fakes. Uh, the Supreme Court said that there was no um, attack on uh, capital. There was no trying to overthrow the United States government and Congress during the time that Trump did not instigate or provoked that kind of. There was a peaceful protest by, by, which is guaranteed by the United States Constitution. So all we can do is assess and hope that he, if uh, he's going to come back as a president of the United States, he's going to come back as a strong leader who is going to deal with the tyrants of this world in a, in a tough way and show a true leadership as inside of the country as it is outside of the country. Many people blame him being an isolationist, but the idea is what he's saying and his vice president is saying, first, we have to take care of the United States. First, we have to put the United States in order so there are no assassinations, so there are no killings, so there are controlled borders. First, we have to put in our economy strong, and then we can take care of our friends around the world. If we fall apart or if we are incapable, we can't help our friends. So that's, that's all I can say at this point in, in short and you know, not to waste too much time. All right. You mentioned something very crucial that a lot, of, like you said, a lot of people are trying to speculate what is going to happen in the future. But not a lot of attention is being paid about. Well, what about now? Because there's still a lot of things that can develop between now and uh, well, November, and even once uh, whoever takes presidential office. So let's actually hone in on that because we are also seeing that European partners, uh, NATO leaders, have come together and try to uh, boost production domestically or at least within the European Union. Do you think that is going to be something that can help Ukraine going forward? Well, absolutely. The stronger, you know, the wars are not won today by sheer force or military strength. That is silly to believe that today, you know, we were much stronger than Afghanistan, for say, or Taliban, and yet we lost to them, or we were much stronger than Vietnam. So forth, many examples like that. The wars are won by combination of things, political, informational wars that we tend to lose, uh, and of course, very, very important economic wars. So if the economy of your country is strong, then your military is strong, then your politics in the world is strong. But the as uh, as President Reagan once said, it's the economy, stupid, uh, saying that <laughs> the economy and uh, without economy, uh, as, as uh, they used to say that during communism, there will be no need for money. But to build communism, we need the money. So capitalism is still here and it is very important because without it, without the economy, it cannot be done. And there's also speculation about whether or not Ukraine and Russia can finally be on a negotiation table and reach any sort of compromise. Now, a lot of people were also saying that it's very less likely due to the fact that no party is willing to make any sort of compromise. Uh, do you think that things might change in the next year going forward? Well, I hope so, because it cannot continue the way it is. And that is where I personally and my uh, my friends and my community is concerned that our president of the United States has no plan. He has not announced, nor anybody in the U.S. administration, that they uh, pronounce the word victory or uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, beating Russians or pushing them out of their land. They're, they're using words like and uh, freedom and things like this, but no victory, no beating Russians 
into losing the war. So uh, hopefully there will be an end to this war, all wars end uh, at, at some point. Of course, the constitution of uh, Ukraine will have to change if they're going to come to some sort of agreement or some sort of a negotiation. Because today in the Ukrainian constitution, it says they will they, they cannot negotiate with the Russians or with Putin, be more precise. While there is still Putin in power, there will be no negotiations, so Ukrainians will continue to fight according to their constitution. So either they continue and fight, or they change their constitution and sit at the uh, at the table to negotiate, while the Russians have the the the, the, the privilege of negotiating. They have the upper hand on it at this point because they have captured the Ukrainian uh, ground. So they will have to, you know, Ukrainians would have to give up some of the ground, which will not be, of course, uh, very popular with Ukraine. And many people understand that it will be only uh, time to give Russians to regroup and attack Ukrainians again and again. That was in Chechnya that way, that was in Georgia that way. That has been out throughout the, the entire history of Russia and Soviet Union. So it is a very, very uh, uh, difficult situation. Uh, hopefully, you know, we all hope that uh, uh, if President Trump becomes a president, uh, it, he kept saying and insisting on one thing. He kept saying, drill, baby, drill, drill, baby, drill, which I interpret as though we're going to drill more oil and gas in our country, on our federal lands, which will bring the prices of uh, uh, energy down to where they were when he was a president until uh, uh, President Biden uh, put the uh, uh, sanction that and put sanction on our Keystone pipeline while lifting the sanctions of the north, uh, northern pipeline of Ru Russia and Germany. So the oil prices will drop, and the oil prices, of course, will dry out Russian coffers to finance the war, Iranian coffers to finance the war with Israel, uh, and te terror wars all around the world. So basically, uh, that is, again, that is my hope, and uh, some of the people that the only a reasonable way to see how to stop this war is either continue with it until the Ukrainians will, let me just show that, to bleed their way, you know, bleed, bleed out and, and uh, be conquered, or to bankrupt Russia, to bankrupt Putin's uh, terror organization, which was, by the way, done by Margaret Thatcher and President Ronald Reagan. What happened, we bankrupt Soviet Union again by dropping oil prices, by negotiating with Saudi Arabia to drop the oil prices where the Russian and the world Soviets at the time could not maintain their war machine and bankrupt them. So hopefully, maybe that will repeat itself again. Gary, thank you so much for being with us on the Eastern Express. And it's always great to have someone who's actually served in NATO to give us the update. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now we're moving on to the Eastern News Flash, a series of all the latest stories from the East that you don't want to miss. A significant shift has been noted in the Ukrainian public opinion regarding holding negotiations with Russia. According to recent polling, 44% of Ukrainians believe it is time for peace talks with Russia. Nonetheless, more than 80% of the Ukrainian population opposes the withdrawal of Ukrainian troops from the countries occupied in annex regions. While 44% of Ukrainians think it is time to start formal peace talks with Russia, 35% disagree and 21% remain undecided. This marks a notable change from a similar survey conducted in 2023, which showed that 64% of Ukrainians oppose direct negotiations with Russia. Back then, only 23% supported such negotiations. Despite the increased openness to talks, the majority of Ukrainians in all regions reject the conditions proposed by Russian President Vladimir Putin. The survey also shows that 83% of respondents oppose the withdrawal of Ukrainian troops from the Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. Moreover, 84% are opposed to the surrender of these territories to Russia. Last but not least, the poll also showed that 58% of respondents disagree with Putin's demand that Ukraine's neutral, non-engagement and non-nuclear status be enshrined in the country's constitution. 22% supported the idea. 
The Latvian Tech Service informed that individuals are prohibited from entering the territory of Latvia in cars registered in Belarus. The ban applies to entering the EU through both Latvian Belarusian and Latvian Russian border crossings. The Latvian tax service says that in order to reduce the risk of sanctions evasion, the EU, by approving the eighth package of sanctions against Belarus, has largely aligned the sanctions imposed on Belarus with those imposed on Russia. Currently, it is prohibited to import goods from Belarus that allow Belarus to diversify its sources of income and support Russian aggression against Ukraine. The list of such goods also includes passenger cars. The entry ban will not apply to vehicles intended for use in the movement of diplomatic and consular missions. Other individuals driving vehicles registered in Belarus will not be able to access EU territory by crossing the Latvian border. All arriving with a car registered in Belarus will have to return to the country from which he or she planned to enter Latvia. Georgia's president, Salam Zurabishvili, has filed a challenge with Georgia's constitutional court over the validity of the recently passed foreign influence bill. The legislation has sparked widespread protests throughout the country, as well as criticism from Georgia's Western partners. According to the president's office, the law is unconstitutional as it contradicts Article 78 of the Georgian Constitution, which mandates the constitutional authorities to take all measures within the scope of their powers to ensure the full integration of Georgia with the EU and NATO. Opponents of the law point out its similarities with legislation used by Vladimir Putin to stifle dissent and independent institutions in Russia, prompting some Georgians to call the measure a Russian law. The Georgian government passed the law that imposes strict controls on foreign-funded media and NGOs, which get more than 20% of their funding from abroad, a year after initially rejecting the law's first version due to public pressure. This year's legislative battle sparked mass street protests and intensified Zurabishvili's clashes with the government over what she and the demonstrators say is their country's commitment to integration with the West. And that's all on this episode of Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World.